Okay, first, um, <clears throat> before starting my talk, um, being very practical and being a TP teacher, um, <clears throat> I like to do something quite practical. So I want to show you practically how uh, you can demonstrate the effect of the butterfly effect because I'll, I'll talk a bit about it later. But it's a small, how something small change or how a different action can have a, you know, a completely different result. So if you um, just bear with me while I disappear in the dark. <coughs> okay, so I'll just turn this on full screen. So what I'm going to do, um, I've got this incredibly sophisticated. Uh, set up here with a little light from my bicycle and uh, three batteries to give it a bit of weight. What I'm going to do, I'm going to have a long shutter speed, well, a long uh, open shutter, and I'm going to swing this light, and I'm going to do it twice, just seeing how the different results will be. Okay, so I'm going to swing it. Okay, <clears throat> and then, um, okay, let's see what happens. It comes up. Yes. Okay. So that's the result you get. Okay. So I'm going to try and do exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, just do exactly the same thing again. I'll just hold it up for a bit longer. Okay. Let's see. Let's see the result. Okay, now, although they look slightly, well, they look slightly similar, but depending on exactly how my hand moves and the amount of pressure and the amount of force I put into it, it has massive um, changes in the end result. And that's just what I'm going to quickly just uh, show you. Um, so, two years ago, when I, went, um, <clears throat> when I went to South Africa to, my, to visit my grandmother, and it was a pleasant afternoon, and I was about to get in the car, and she sort of, she sort of held my arm. And you know when someone holds you, and it just feels slightly different. And, and I sort of, she grabbed her arm, and I sort of looked, and, I, and she just looked at me with this, you know, she had this look in her eye, and I couldn't really make out what she, wanted to say, because she didn't really, she didn't say anything. And uh, eventually after, you know, after a few seconds, she said, do everything, my child, do everything. And, and it just all made sense, because that look in her eye was uh, just a look of regret. Uh, not necessarily about things she did, but about things she, she had not done or didn't do in her life. 83 years at that point, um, and she, she's, she's got regrets about things she didn't do in her life. And that really stuck with me, and, it, and, and throughout this talk, I'm going to explain to you how that changed my life. Um, and then, yeah, so what I forgot to say is, you know, she basically, in her own words, being 83 years old, to, told me YOLO. And, it's, and it, is a bit, it is a bit of a cliche, um, but that's what she said. That's what she said. And that, that is really it stuck with me and really changed my life. Okay, so the butterfly effect. Some of you might have heard about the, uh, the butterfly effect. It's, it's uh, with a doctoral thesis presented by Edward Lawrence. Now, he did research about weather, weather patterns, and then he had these data, and he realized that if he, even small changes in the data, just like rounding to the nearest decimal, would, when entered into his computer models, will have drastically different end results. So he used the metaphor of, the, of, the, of when a butterfly flaps its wings, it would set off a chain reaction of air molecules that would cause a, a, a hurricane somewhere else in the world. Right? And uh, he, he presented these findings to the New York Academy of Science, and they completely threw it out because they didn't believe in it. But it was a really interesting concept. And because it was interesting, it hung around in legends and in, in stories. They even made a movie about it. So, uh, in the mid-90s, scientists prov proved it to be true. It's now known as the, the law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And it basically means that a small initial change could have a drastically massive impact 
for the, for the future. And the end result, have a drastically different end result. Now, um, oh, and then during my research, I stumbled upon a TED talk of, of Andy, Andy Andrews. And it was incredible, and I, and I wanted you know just give him the credit for it because it's, it's a completely his work, it's none, none of mine, but it was such a good example that I just wanted to use it for, for my talk, just as the introduction. Now, he, Andy Andrews, he talks about Norman Borlaug. Now, Norman Borlaug was hybridized corn and wheat, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. Hybridizing corn and wheat makes, just basically means to make it tougher. So his research meant that areas like Siberia, Deserts in America, parts of infertile areas in Africa could now produce corn and wheat, which they couldn't previously do. And then scientists calculated the impact of his research and, and, and put a value on it. And they said his research saved more than a billion lives from famine, which is an incredible number that one person can have this massive impact on the world. Like, you know, 10, 15 percent of the world's uh, population is now alive because of this man. But if you really think of it, well, if you think of it further, you get to this guy, Henry Wallace. Now, Henry, Henry Wallace was uh, vice president, vice president under Roosevelt of the U, uh, United States, and he was secretary of agriculture. Now, one of his uh, passion, well, obviously his passion was was uh, agriculture and plants, and he set up a research facility as part of his job. And he hired a talented scientist named Norman Borlaug to run this project and to run his product specifically doing research into hybridizing corn and wheat. So if you really think about it, it's Henry Wallace who set up this research facility, who employed Norman Borlaug, who saved a billion lives and won the Nobel Prize. But then you can go even further. You can consider George Washington Carver. He was a student at Iowa State University, and he babysat his professor's son. And he would take the little boy, and he would take him on uh, expeditions between these in the botanical gardens, show him how amazing plants were and what they meant to the world. My, getting him to, to build up this passion for plants and agriculture. So if you really think about it, it was George Washington Carver that inspired Henry Wallace, who employed Norman Borlaug, who saved a billion lives and won the Nobel Prize. Unless you consider a guy, Moses, Moses Washington. He was a farmer at, in Diamond, Missouri. And in those days, he lived in a, in, a, in, a, in a slave state. And he didn't agree with slavery. And so did a few people in the area. And these guys, Quintrill's raiders, they would go to these places, people who didn't agree with slavery, and absolutely destroy their farms. And, and in some cases, like in the case of his neighbors, killed some of the people. So the, Moses went to the neighboring farm, trying to help, and he heard something in one of the rooms, and he went over, and he opened this cupboard, and there was a baby hidden away. And he took the baby and found out later that their parents were killed. The parents hiding the baby to save them from before being killed themselves, to save the little child. So if you really think about it, it was Moses who saved George Washington Carver, who inspired Henry Wallace, who employed Norman Borlaug, that saved a million, billion lives, and, and, and won the Nobel Prize. And, and the amazing thing is, we can go on for millions and millions. Andrew Andrews has shown us that you can, you can go on for millions of years thinking of where it all started. Where did it all start? You know, this whole chain reaction of things that could have gone different in different ways. Where did it all start? So, I've got, I've got these guys. I don't know, we can, Helga and, I don't know, Jeff over here, right? So they, they, um, like 20,000 years ago, either died, killed someone, or didn't kill someone, or died, or didn't die, which set off a chain reaction, which ended up in Moses, 
then saving the baby and so on and so on, and then with Norman Borlaug winning the Nobel Prize and saving a billion people. And even more amazing, we can go on in the future. Think of how many billions of lives will be impacted because of that. Another, another quick example is um, the little boy. The little boy was the, uh, <coughs> uh, the nuclear bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Now, only 1.3% of the, you know, we, um, my mouth is getting really dry. Is anyone got a bit of water for me? Please. <laughs> um, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, little boy was a, uh, was a bomb that was dropped in Hir Hiroshima. Now, uh, only 1.3% of the uranium actually fission. It's about the weight of a banknote, 0 0.7 gram. And that killed 80,000 people and destroyed two-thirds of, of a city's building. Now, two da three days later, George Sweeney was ordered to drop another fat man, another nuclear bomb, on Kukura. Now, he, he was circling with, his, with those, one of those big bomber planes. He was circling over Kukura, circling and circling for more than an hour, trying to drop this bomb, trying to get a visual on the target, trying to basically kill everyone that was there. But he couldn't. He couldn't get a visual on the target. So he was ordered to go to the secondary target, which was Nagasaki, where 75,000 people died. There might be people sitting here in this auditorium who would not have been here if their get grandparents wasn't saved by the clouds. It's an amazing thought. Amazing thought. Okay, just a, bit, a few examples, just a bit closer to home. Um, you, even like in a health lesson, you know, someone could teach a really good health lesson that would get you to, to, take, to make really wise decisions. One day when you start either family planning or, or, or starting a sexual relationship. How much different would that be if you make wise decisions? If in my own life, I would have, um, I was entered to go to Nick Terry's tennis school in, in Florida. Family situation meant I couldn't go. Now, now, instead of being a professional tennis player, I'm here <laughs> giving a TED talk. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. You know, who, I might have had like Andre Agassi. One of the first lines in Andre Agassi's um, autobiography is, I hate tennis. You know, so yes, my family situation was, was sad, and that meant I couldn't go there, but now I'm here loving it. Yeah. So you never know how your life is going to turn out. So that brings me, <clears throat> that brings me to my conclusion. And I want to leave three things with you. First of all, stop worrying. You know, we, how many times, how many of you do we lay in our beds at night worrying about things, thinking, oh, what's going you know, to happen? What am I going to do with this? And what am I going to do with that? Not being able to do anything about it. You know, how are you going to, because you can, our lives are products of billions and billions of variables that can change at any second. You know, someone's decision to, to drink and drive, someone's decision to you know, play the lottery, you know, have somewhere else in the world can have an impact on your life tomorrow or today or now. Right? So don't worry. There's so many things that's happening. And I'm not saying go and sit in your bedroom and just sit there and try and be safe. I don't want people to go and be all paranoid. It's just, you know, don't worry. Live your life. Yeah? Don't go and mortgage. You take a two million dirham um, mortgage and go and buy a Ferrari and see how far you can go with it. But, you know, you need, still need to make sensible decisions in life. But don't worry. Life will, things will happen, but you will get through it. You will make it work. Um, <clears throat> secondly, be aware of your actions. You know, because your actions could have long-lasting, eternal effects. You know, and that's good and bad things. Things like, um, Giving to charity, you know, random acts of kindness. Um, if you being mean to someone, you know, that could make them, over a period of time, that could make them a lot shyer than they would have been. You know, that would make them go in a different direction. It's not necessarily good or bad, but you know, generally, if you do good things, more good things happen. Yeah, 
awareness and be really aware of your actions. Um, a friend of mine once said, and he's, a, he's an atheist, and, uh, you know, so he, and we had this discussion about life after death. And he made a, he made a really good point, and, uh, um, and it was amazing, and it, it stuck with me. Is that he said, you know, he, he doesn't necessarily believe in life after death, but, but what he believes as to be uh, eternal life, or his life to live forever, is the change that he's going to make to this world. You know, the, the actions, the actions that he does, the, the, the good that he brings to the world, would live on forever. Like we saw from Norman Bolo and uh, Helga and Jeff over there. The good things they do will live on forever, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of years. So really be aware of your actions. And then thirdly, and this brings me, this brings me back to my, what my grandmother told me, is, is uh, you know, live your life. Live, every, live for every second. How many times do we, uh, you've, you've, you've planned to go somewhere or meet people and you lay in your bed or you're on your sofa and you're like, oh, you know, you're, not, you're not up for this. You know, just say to yourself, YOLO. It's become a bit of a, a thing in our house that if, you, if, if, if one of us are not up for something, all you need to do is just say YOLO and, if, and the other person has to go. You can't, you can't argue. You can't argue with, with YOLO. Okay, so live your life. Yes, okay, that's some, and that made me, oh yeah, that, sorry, that brings me to what I did after. I made a bucket list, which is also a bit 2008 like YOLO. But I made a bucket list, and some of the things on there, um, you know, do an Ironman triathlon. I did it. Um, do a, a, a talk in public, and I'm, I'm busy doing that. Um, Where's, where's Prem? Am I allowed to plug something? Where's, am I allowed to say something about the, Inish, the cripple of Inish Man? Okay, I won't. I won't, sorry. Um, there's, um, I'm, uh, I'm playing in this play, the cripple of Inish Man. And that's the first time I'm doing that. Yes, okay, that means sometimes in my life is a bit hectic at times. I find myself 10 o'clock at night cycling, you know, training for the Ironman. But then, you know, what, what would I have done otherwise? Sit in front of the TV. Right? I'm not losing any sleep about it. But you are, you know, just live a full life. And, um, you know, learn new skills. And uh, I, think, I think that's the end of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>